have us take from this um, reading of your word. Um, the passage I'm going to read um, is right after Moses admonished Pharaoh that all of the firstborn in Egypt will die if he does not release um, the people of Israel. And this is when the first Passover is instituted. said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Our epistle reading for this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, reading from the 13th chapter. Beginning with verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandments are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we began to obtain believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery or licentiousness, but in quarreling and not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ to grunt and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. And then we turn to uh, Matthew's Gospel, reading from the 18th chapter. Beginning with the 15th verse. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault. <clears throat> go and point out this fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, 
Take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the witnesses of two or three. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such as one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> my liberal Christian friends have a hard time with the story that we read from our Old Testament this morning. You see, the idea of the Father of the loving Jesus Christ striking down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, is just too abhorrent for them. It is this type of text that Muslim fundamentalists could pick up out of our Bible and say to the world that our religion is based on violence and is dedicated to the destruction of any people who worship any other god. In fact, there are countless texts in the Old Testament that a Muslim fundamentalist could select to make a point that what Christian fundamentalists say about Islamic scriptures is fundamentally, fundamentally true about our own. My liberal friends would like to, and often do, as we all do, create a personal canon out of the church's scriptures. That means that we commit the heresy of tossing out those parts of the Bible that we don't like and live as if they aren't part of the canon of Christian scripture. We all do it. We all have texts that we pre would prefer not to deal with. Most of my conservative friends would like to dump most of those love your enemy texts. And any of the texts where God explains that the purpose of government is to protect and watch after those who are the most vulnerable in society. That's our job. We all have a personal canon of scripture created out of the church's scriptures, and this morning's Old Testament reading is often left out of our personal canons. It would be okay if we just dropped verses 12 and 13. that says, essentially, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. We just leave those out. The blood will be assigned to you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. We'd like to leave those out, but the truth of the matter is that the God we worship is both a God of justice and a jealous God. In our reading from the Old Testament for this morning, God reveals God's self to be both just and jealous. Our reading tells the origins of the Passover festival, but we must keep the origins of the Passover within its context. We must remember that Pharaoh had instigated a genocide against the Hebrews. His chief labor force had become a sizable minority within the land, and so as the scriptures tell us, he decided to deal shrewdly with them. And so official government policy was to oppress them even more to the extent that the policies toward these immigrants from Canaan became ruthless, according to the scriptures. Ultimately, Pharaoh instructed the midwives and the Hebrews to kill all boys that were born to the Hebrew women. And when that policy didn't work, Pharaoh instructed his people to take matters into their own hands these immigrants aren't like us, and they are a threat to our nation, so government policy is that all red-blooded Egyptians have permission to throw every boy born to the Hebrews into the Nile. That's the context of the Passover. That's the context of God's justice, and that, my friends, is genocide. For the attempted genocide of God's people, God responded by striking down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, thus executing on all the gods of Egypt who would allow such a thing to take place. I find it interesting that unlike the Egyptian policy of genocide, 
God chose to strike down only the firstborn. By striking down only the firstborn, God demonstrated that God alone is God over creation. By striking down both human beings and animals, God demonstrated his lordship over all creation. That first Passover was not an act of revenge, but an enacted proclamation that the God of Hebrews is Lord of all, and he stands up for those who are oppressed. The firstborn represents fertility in the ancient Mediterranean culture. It represented life, it represented a future. And by striking down the firstborn, God proclaimed himself the source of all life and the Lord over humanity's future while executing justice on the objects of worship of a people who would allow such oppression to take place in their midst and would allow the annihilation of another race of people. That, my friends, is the act of a just God. But God also reveals God's self to be a jealous God. The Hebrews are instructed to take some of the blood of the Passover lamb and put it on the two doorposts and the lintels of the houses in which they eat the Passover meal. The blood is a sign for them. The sign is an identifier. By marking their houses with the blood of the lamb, they are identifying themselves as servants of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are setting themselves apart from those who serve any other God. God chose to let God's people choose which God they would serve. You get to choose if you put the blood on your house or not. But if you put the blood on the house, you know that you are setting yourself apart from everyone else in the country, except for those who put the blood on their house. The choice is there. But God is a jealous God who demands that those who choose to serve him must publicly acknowledge him as the only God they will serve. Now, for those of us who do not suffer oppression, by any standard comparable to what is experienced in other countries. We have the luxury of being a little squeamish about worshiping a God of justice. Those of us who live in a country where freedom of religion is a cherished right guaranteed by our wonderful constitution, we have the luxury of being a little squeamish about worshiping a jealous God. But I doubt that the Hebrews living in Egypt at the time of the inaugural Passover were squeamish about worshiping a just and jealous God. I bet they would have sung with the psalmist, let the faithful exalt in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches, not making bricks while in the sun. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the people, to bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron, and to execute, execute on them the judgment decree. This is glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. You see, this just and jealous God is also our Savior. The one on, on the day this jealous God we worship was executing justice, this same God also saved all those who acknowledged him as their God. On the day in which God revealed himself to be the source of all life and the Lord over humanity's historical future, God also offered salvation to all who would acknowledge him as Lord. Therefore, God's people down through the ages have celebrated the Passover as a festival to the Lord our God. On one such occasion, our just and jealous God watched as his son, Jesus Christ, God's firstborn, was slaughtered. Supposedly in an effort to save God's people from heresy, or to save them from the feared crackdown by the government. And for the murder of God's son, God responded by raising him from the dead, once again demonstrating that God alone is Lord of life and death, and will not let injustice ever have the final word. In raising Jesus from the dead, the injustice of the cross 
was reversed by a just God. In raising Jesus from the dead, God set, took judge and made, took the one who had been judged and made him the judge, making Jesus the judge over the living and the dead. But the God we worship is also a jealous God. In resurrecting Jesus from the dead, God again puts before all human beings a choice of whom they will serve. And it is a choice that we decide in every decision we make every day. It is a choice revealed by our calendars, by our checking check accounts, and by our actions. The choice is ours. But God is a jealous God who demands priority over all other allegiances in our lives so that worshipers of other gods are fully aware of whose we are without us ever having to say a word. We do not put blood on our doorposts, but as the Apostle Paul says, we put on our Lord Jesus Christ. And we remind ourselves and nourish ourselves with the sacrament of his body broken and his blood shed out of his love for the world so that we might be strengthened by Christ himself to take up our cross and follow him until we have set loose all oppressed people in the world so that they can sing praises to the God of justice revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord and God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. To God be the glory. Amen. I invite you to respond to God's word by singing together as the Jesus. 